Welcome to Agile Roots 2010, sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vario, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. Enough Design by Ian McFarland. Um, a lot of that waste, 
that's a genuine. Um, that's good. <laughs> 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 that's where the reduction is going to work out. Um, some of that waste is actually dangerous, right? Uh, some of that creates problems down the road that are, that are sort of hidden landmines that, that can cause problems later. Um, so, the real problem that I want to talk about most is unvalidated too much. Um, the thing is, this process is natural. We're going to make design decisions, and some of them are going to be wrong. And the problem isn't so much that we are making wrong design decisions, it's that we're spending a lot of time between when we, when we make the bad design decision and when we correct, when we correct the bad design decision. So again, if it's a month or a year, that's bad. If this is a week or a day or a minute, that's just part of a healthy design process. And this is, I mean, this is obviously something that's not new to anybody in the animal space. The idea of you know, short iterations, and the shorter you can make the iteration, the shorter you can make the feedback cycle being critical is, is endemic to, to the whole agile mindset. Um, what you don't want to do is sort of go wandering off into the desert with your, with your project. Uh, if you're a little startup and you have a certain amount of money, you don't want to be like, sort of analogous to this guy wandering off into the desert if he only has water for like four days. Uh, you kind of want to know um, that you're going someplace useful, uh, that you have enough means to get there, because otherwise you end up like him. Now, that said, the journey is itself valuable, right? If you uh, know exactly where you're going, you miss sometimes the opportunity to find a place like this. As you're wandering, sometimes you find really interesting things that weren't what, uh, what you set out to find. It's certainly true of these guys, right? They went off, you know, they convinced the, the Queen of Spain to send them off to find a trade route uh, to get to Kublai Khan's China. That's not what they found. It was probably useful for us, since we're all in the place that they found, but they did go off on that journey, even though that wasn't what they set out to do. So there's a tension there, right? There's a, there's a, there's a tension between wanting to have enough figured out so that you're going into a place that you can get to, but being willing to make changes along the way uh, as you discover new things on the journey. Uh, this is an example of a website. It started out as a social shopping site. Uh, this is CoTweet. So CoTweet is actually a collaborative uh, Twitter client for people to do brand management. And the reason that they started doing this is because as they set out to do their social shopping site, they realized as they were trying to support their brand that working on Twitter was really, really hard if you were more than one person. And of course, being a company, they had more than one person actually collaborating on things. So they discovered this hidden need that they hadn't really set out to find. Uh, but they were open to it. And I think it's really important to sort of be open to these new things that you discover on the way, even if that's not where you set up. So, that, I mean, again, there's this tension between going in a direction and then being able to iterate and find your way to the right, to, to the thing that ends up being the right thing for your company. Um, to go with respect to the waterfall example, one of the things that's in, there's a really strong tension between sort of the design community uh, and the Agile development community, um, this is a genuine case study. We, we had this one project uh, where through market pressures, et cetera, we had, uh, the clients had decided that they were gonna use a design firm, uh, but they had a finite amount of money to spend on it, so they, went, they gave them two months to come up with a complete spec for the whole thing, and the result was this 500 page period. It was a genuine 500 page uh, product requirement document. And they gave it to us, and um, it was actually pretty good. This is actually an example of a fairly successful waterfall design. Um, during the course of development, so, we, so they gave us the first version of the PRD. Uh, we started developing for a while. Uh, then there were some, they did a little more work on the, on the project. Um, they came back with some changes and they gave us a new version of the 500 page PRD. And it was really hard to figure out exactly what had changed. Uh, and then there was again the third version. Um, the thing is, again, this was an incredibly well thought out 500 page waterfall PRD. There were only a couple big problems with it. And the site that came out of it was actually pretty good. Um, this is the site, this is Vine Caroline, this is the site that we did maybe four years ago. Um, unfortunately, one of the problems was the navigation. Uh, basic navigation, this is, as you can maybe see, this is a fairly user generated content site, a whole lot of content, 
basically three layers deep of, of content. And the navigation that they've worked out just fundamentally didn't work. There's this little tiny nav uh, element that you had to mouse into, mouse across, maybe traverse 600 pixels inside of a 10 pixel high boundary and to, in order to get to the, to the content that was buried. And of course, because it's so pervasive, it caused an awful lot of rework on a lot of the fundamental assumptions inside. So this is a good example of how that, uh, that unvalidated assumption, the single unvalidated assumption, even when everything else was done really well, had a huge cost associated with it. Uh, so one of the problems that we see a lot in the design world is that there's this cult of the rock star designer. Um, it, it's hard to refute that some people do an incredibly good job of upfront design. Uh, Jonathan and I did a really nice job on the iPod and, and the iMac and various other things. Of course, they do iterate, but in longer cycles. Um, the problem is, even if you can do it, um, that being able to give the feedback makes it so much easier to, to, to do this well. And the fact is, most people aren't Jonathan and I. Most people can't come up with the right design from the beginning. And it's, it's so much easier to actually test things in smaller increments uh, as you go along. Um, there's a movement of lean startup, which takes a very different perspective. Um, by A-B testing your way to, to design happiness, they take a very rigorous uh, uh, feedback and, and factual based approach to sort of, you know, do you like Coke or Pepsi? This is does this design work better or does this design work better? But the problem is that sometimes without this, we, we think that we can <coughs> our way out of any problem. Uh, this is a degenerate case of that. I don't think this startup is going to go anywhere. Uh, the fact is, you have to have, in order to be able to A-B test anything, you have to have some assumptions that are meaningful to test. Um, am I a teenage girl? Am I an auto manufacturer? There are so many possible things. Uh, when we test things like uh, two different strings in, in a piece of marketing, you could test an arbitrary set of strings, but the fact is you're still doing some design to say, does this, does this little phrase work as a, as, as a marketing slug, is this, or is this phrase better? There is design that's implicit in this process. And what I'm sort of getting at here is that I think we need to get to a point where we are respecting the design that happens in the little increments. Uh, but still validating it, and validating it with, with feedback, and with metrics and various other things. Um, we know that research is important. We know that uh, doing market research and understanding our customers is really important. And yet, there's an awful lot of sites that are out there where there's no evidence at all that they've done any research. Right? Um, even Phil Cracker, uh, are people familiar with Phil Cracker? It's an agile planning tool that we've built. Um, so it's, it's an awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I can get five bucks later. Um, um, yeah, so this is a tool that we built. Just on the <laughs> <laughs> my slides back. But in any case. Is there anybody who knows the AP setup here? In any case, I can see Toby. Toby? Sorry, what's it? The projectors down. The projector just went down? It's got a pretty good AP. It's really cold. Sorry, right? So, in any case, we know the design is really important. Um, and yet, we have a lot of products where uh, oh, and research is important. We know that understanding market fit is really important. Uh, and yet, so often there are products that we find in the marketplace close <laughs> that that are really successful. That where there's no evidence that they've gone and done their market research. Uh, Phil Cracker is one where all we were doing was scratching our own itch, right? Um, we needed an agile planning tool. We happen to be a perfect target customer for that because we do agile. We've been doing agile for, for, for many, many years now. And so a tool that works for us is probably going to be better than average in terms of a tool. But that said, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a market for it. We, we, we haven't validated that there's a market for it. Um, 
In the case of Tracker, we were just building it for ourselves, so that doesn't matter. Uh, it became a product because we sort of let it out into the wild. But if you're a startup and you're trying to figure out what should I spend, you know, five hundred thousand dollars building, uh, it's probably really important to find out before you get started that it's worth spending the time and effort on. Um, here's another good example of a company that doesn't do a whole lot of visible research. Um, Google has lots of uh, lots of great products. This was came up in the last talk. Um, a bunch of these products, really very good, very uh, unique products in the space. Um, but there are some that are not as good. Do you remember what Google Video when it first came out? Uh, Google Video, they spent a whole lot of money uh, licensing content. They have exclusive deal with CBS. Uh, I think millions of dollars spent uh, getting access to content. They didn't even bother to have different icons for the different shows, the top five shows on CBS. It'd be like if Lost just had a ABC icon. Um, another not so great example uh, of Google design was uh, approval. And then there's some other some designs. So what's, what's interesting about the designs that were successful is that these are kind of all things that a software developer could envision and could product manage. Uh, Google as a culture is very focused around things that are technical, things that are uh, that where the design is where the design is emergent from just being able to use the products as you go. Um, there's some other interesting Google groups that's something that's kind of in that space, but even so, it's really functionally hard to use. Um, so of these great products, another thing that's interesting is a lot of them are acquisitions. They actually innovate more by uh, bringing products in. Um, and of course, things like Google Video, they had to replace with YouTube because it wasn't actually working for them. Um, only a few of them actually generate revenue. So when we think about something like Google as, a, as an example of an incredible company, it's still an incredible company. They're doing some amazing things. Actually, Android is just starting to generate revenue. Um, but the, what they're really good at is stuff that, is, that a developer could envision and could execute on. Uh, this is a big difference between them and Apple. Apple is creating consumer products that aren't just for people like them working inside the company. But the thing is, there's some hidden design going on. Even though they're not designing it, the people who work there are capable of, of creating very good products in the segments that, they're, that they have a natural affinity to. So I'm really just trying to show that that, that, um, that, that design is still happening, even though it's not a, an explicit uh, task in many cases. Um, when I talk about design, what do I mean by design? This came up actually in Andrew's session, too. Um, there's an awful lot of different kinds of design. Instead of not talking about software design, I'm talking about product design, or not code, code design, but software, but product design, software design. There's an awful lot of different kinds of design. Um, there's visual design, information design, uh, user experience design, interaction design, uh, user research, usability design, usability testing, product design, branding, and we'll talk about branding just now, demographic research, Psychographic research, AB testing, typography design, industrial design, etc., etc., etc. So again, so the question that one of the problems that we have when we talk about how much design should be done is that we tend to conflate all these into a single thing. We we'll say, well, should you do upfront design or should you do like incremental design? Uh, and in, in that, we sort of miss the thing of like how much research should you do, how much. Uh, visual design should be, how much usability design, how much how much uh, branding, and how much uh, all these all these different things. And we need to look at them as, as separate. So when we think about again, when we think about how much is enough, all of these factors sort of play out into uh, diff each different kind has sort of a different lead time associated with it. I tend to think of it uh, software design much like uh, development is very practical. Right? Uh, what I usually see is working well is where we have uh, a, enough upfront market research that says that this is a product that we actually want to build. Uh, enough upfront um, thought about what the branding is and what the market opportunity 
frequency is and what the voice is, so that we're not just going off into the wilderness. We know roughly what it is we want to go. And then we can refine as we go, and then be iterative as we go, and uh, get feedback, and test our assumptions, and come up with good hypotheses, and really build the right product. Um, I think in an agile frame, there's a bunch of things that work differently. Uh, I think uh, we need different tools than we did prior to agile in order to make design work well. And I think there's a real tension between the structurally the way design firms are sort of used to going about design. They're used to this sort of fixed fee, you have three months build this of design, uh, and then you're done thing. And the way agile teams kind of like to work, and, and usually time and materials, usually short iterations, usually lots of feedback, and usually lots of flexibility. Um, good, agile, good designs for an agile team are really modular, really principled, really, uh, really rule-based. Um, I think it's much more useful to be able to ask questions like, where should this piece, if we have a good domain model, for example, we can ask questions like, where should this piece of content live? And come up with a reasonable answer, even without somebody sitting and looking at that specific thing. We know that uh, this is, uh, you know, we're in a trading application. We know this is trade related, so it goes in the trades page. We know that this is a, uh, this is account related, so it goes in the accounts page. Uh, we know that it's this kind of module, so it's gonna have this kind of topography and this kind of placement and this kind of, this kind of boundaries. These kinds of rules are really helpful as we also go and iteratively develop these things because we have some rules to apply to it so that the first time we're, we're implementing it, it looks reasonable. Um, I think user interactions are much more important for us to get in terms of design than pixel, uh, pixel position. Um, when it works really well but for us, what, what we see from a design firm is uh, a whole bunch of wireframes that talk about uh, what the edge cases are, like what is the minimum, you know, what does it look like when there's nothing in the photo scroller? What does it look like when it's full, when it's partially full, when there's 20 pages? What does the pagination look like? Um, the pixel positioning is something we find is really well done just by sitting down with pairing a developer <coughs> with, uh, with a designer and having them just do it together. Something that works, you know, pairing works great from a developer perspective, but it also works really, really well from a steady state design and development perspective. Um, it, one of the nice things that's, that sort of implicit in that is you get all this knowledge transfer from the designer to the developer and back about what's expensive, what's cheap, uh, what's uh, what works well, what doesn't work well, both on the design and developer, from the design and developer perspective. Um, low fidelity sketches are so much more valuable than high fidelity PSDs. That 500 page PSD, uh, PRD that we got had lots of beautiful pictures of every page, but you had to look at it really closely to figure out what was the new information on it. And so to me, the artifacts that are, that are most valuable are the ones that, where every line on the page tells you something you didn't know before. I think if we can get to where the artifacts that we're producing are just the essentials, just the very minimum things that tell us something new about the application, those are the kinds of artifacts that I think are really, really useful. Um, so, getting close to the end of the, sort of the Talk part of this. Uh, one big question before we go through that, before we get to the end, is sort of like, what's the lightest weight thing that will actually get the job done? To me, this is a great question to ask yourself uh, from when you're evaluating a design artifact, when you're a, your designer trying to create a design artifact. Um, the whole notion of enough design to me is there's a tension between doing too little and doing too much. Um, there is an amount that's it's very clear that, that projects often suffer from not having enough design, uh, but also they can be, you know, that we, we get that lag down to the minimum, and we have these lightweight artifacts that really tell us something new with every with every line on the page. I think we get a long way to eliminating a lot of the waste that's sort of endemic in, in traditional uh, design documents and traditional design processes. Um, so. The framework for this whole talk came out of a session that actually Anders put together back in January uh, in San Francisco. Uh, there's a discussion that we're, that's just starting to really happen, I think, in the design community and, and, and in the agile community about how these two pieces really fit together well. And so this talk is sort of the beginning of a sort of call to talk about 
what are the things that really work effectively? Like we know what the problem is. I think this is sort of an explanation of sort of what the problem is and sort of how we can think about solving the problem. But there, but I think we can also come up with a bunch of best practices. I think we have a good set of people in the room to start a discussion about what are some of the best practices that we can apply uh, so that we can learn this and, and teach the design community what we learned in the agile development community. Uh, and, and teach and, and learn to all be better at, at creating really good products uh, and integrating the design process more fully into the development process and vice versa. So one of the things that we've done is we've taken a lot of uh, work sessions. Uh, I know Andrews is doing uh, meetings in, in New York, but I've been, and I've also been doing a bunch in San Francisco to sort of talk about how do these two pieces fit together. Um, one of the questions that I ask a lot is, what are the techniques that you use to develop the design and what are the artifacts that you generate? Um, so why don't we just sort of start throwing out some things that you found that have been useful in design artifacts or in design techniques that work for you. Um, I'll give you a bunch that we, uh, that we have come up with along the way. So the one that we used in the session this morning, although in a very microcosmic way, was uh, Design Studio. Yes. Which is, uh, I think it draw, pulls together a lot of different uh, components of um, agile thinking into uh, a rich activity. Can you define it just really quickly for um, So Design Studio is uh, collaborative sketching, uh, but it's structured collaborative sketching. Uh, so you, it's, it's divided into uh, passive ideation to get the, what's called like an ideation clearinghouse. Uh, and once you've done the ideation clearinghouse, basically getting all things out of your head that you're envisioning. Sort of like what they were talking about the earlier session about this gentleman who uh, with the, the poker guy or whatever. Right. So to get that thing out of his head, we want to know what's in your head. So we, when we build something, we want to make sure that we're doing that with an awareness of what you built. So that's the first step. The second step is now let's iterate on that as a team. Now we have all of our ideas out on the table. Let's do rapid iteration. And so, so you everybody gets to sell everybody else's ideas to one another, and then you iterate it in rapid, rapid sequence until you have something that you feel uh, you know is has value. Any other techniques people have used that they find really useful? Um, for people who want to do usability testing, and I advocate that you should be. <laughs> You should concentrate on what I call formative usability testing, which is usability testing that is helping you define design decisions. Um, and a really good place to start if you want to take a look at techniques is something, is a paper that was published by Michael Medlock et al. when they were at Microsoft Games. It's called the RITE, R-I-T-E, that's a, an acronym. Um, yeah, so I would I'd advocate RITE testing as a way to go. Can you talk a little bit more about write testing specifically does? Okay. Um, well, I'm going to compare formative versus what is commonly called summative usability testing. Summative usability testing is basically checking to make sure that a product that you've built hits certain usability requirements. Okay. Formative usability testing is more exploratory in nature. It's basically trying to it's, it's looking at doing the minimum, creating the minimum level prototype, and then driving people's behavior to it, through it. So you're, you're watching behavior, and you're using a prototype, but it's a paper-based prototype, for example, something that's very easy to iterate on, but what you're checking is a user's behavior. And what you're trying to uncover really quickly are the humongous blocking problems, right? So one of the things that's very different about right testing than more formal testing is that you can make changes in a prototype after one user between sessions, for example. And honestly, I, it's really hard to encapsulate this for me. So, uh, yeah. So I, mean, I think, again, what you're getting at is you're, you're trying to expose the big design problems. Yeah, right? because the other thing about that, that is that it's just like, um, these kinds of problems are like dams that, that block further design process. Once you've kind of, you can't discover other ones until you take care of the huge design problems. Right, 
right? And I think this sort of gets at that sort of fractal nature of design exactly. and development. Yeah. So you, you, there are these really big things that stop you even, it's not even relevant to talk about fine scale questions until you resolve some of these really coarse yeah. scale questions. So being able to create hypotheses and test them cheaply, right. that, to me that, that's the essence of what, what sort of agile design is about. Right. So I mean, techniques that you, you mentioned, other, other techniques people have. Uh, maybe you know that while you were giving the presentation, but uh, I usually find that design, uh, design is made by a contractor. Um, I'm all at once, and then just send them uh, uh, So the technique that I've seen working is a very simple, but it's convincing the design where the contractor to have a designer <coughs> If the contract with the design firm is structured in a way where they can do time and materials and engage in the, in the team over the course of the project, it's very hard to overcome that. Right? And so part of this, I think, is about educating the design community and the, and the customer community about how valuable it is to have the designer fully integrated with the team. And, you know, what I found is that there's prejudice, sort of like uh, lots of managers or human resources people saying, why would you want the full time scrum master? It's going to be idle most of the time. Right. Uh, same thing I heard about designers. I mean, they could just need to work for a week and walk away, which is not true. Right. right. Other techniques, people? I think kind of the touching upon the, the idea of kind of cross pollination of competencies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like Jeff Patton says, you know, uh, um, the closer you get to someone, or, or, or you know, proximity and increase in proximity improves fidelity. And so, working with developers and developers with user experience designers, um, you know, you have that open communication, and they become, in essence, a part of your world, and uh, you kind of a part of theirs, and uh, you pick up skills, you know, from them, and they pick up skills from you. And obviously this, this can be taken, not just user research, but pair programming, like I believe you had mentioned, right. uh, just sitting down with the developer while he's going through things. And uh, I think that that right there goes a long way, a real long way, especially working as a single team in a single unit. Um, and something that, uh, that Anders touched upon is with the restaurant metaphors, uh, he, he talked about the, the the chef or, or, or whoever, the, the owner that was successful in all his restaurants, he knew what was going on in every aspect, every part of that restaurant, he understood what was going on. Um, and I think that's important in any team for everyone to kind of have a pretty good idea of what's going on on this side of the team and this side of the team, this side of the team. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I see the integration, you're next. Uh, I see the integration of the designers into the core team as at the large scale, is absolutely critical, but also that, that pair, like actually having the pair with developers, and that kind of communication, that, that proximity that you get from that is so valuable because they really get insight into what the design constraints are and into what artifacts you have to communicate. And often you don't need artifacts if you're pairing with the developer. All the fine scale stuff we see done most effectively by, again, by having the designer sitting down with the person who's actually doing the CSS or the HTML and saying, that's a little too far to the left, and then they can try it, and they can get again. Can I get the feedback cycle down to seconds, not not days or even you know the iteration? Uh, it's extremely valuable. In, in terms of techniques and other other exposures here, I, I like what's been said about sketching, and, mm -hmm. and and if it's not known, one really great resource on sketching is a book by Bill Buxton entitled "Sketching User Experiences." Uh, he's a, he's now at Microsoft. Uh, don't hold that against him. Um, they've had some great people. Uh, but he, he goes into a lot of great uh, methodologies. I missed uh, the great talk on Design Studio. But uh, a lot of really great ways where Andrew, like I've heard said, that a few sketches uh, are better than the one type of Fidelity BSD. He said, I would expect that any designer on my team would be able to develop something that looks beautiful. Sure. But to be on my team, you've got to develop five sketches rapidly, and we can quickly get the right solution collaboratively. 
I think it also depends on what medium you're using. We do a lot of server life development in Microsoft, uh, using Microsoft technology. And in server life, there's a great tool that sits in between the sketching and the actual production called, called Sketch Club, which is great for expressing a vector form interactive design that allows you to quickly step through a product and quickly get a sense of not just the, the look um, and not just the wireframe, but the behavior of an application. And you get a lot of great feedback using a, a, a prototype tool like that or, or something like iRise that can sit in the middle and, and you, can, you can publish kind of like Jeff was saying earlier this morning, to a wide audience and get that feedback uh, pretty rapidly as opposed to having to just be paired uh, locally or all this travel. Yeah, well, along the same lines that uh, the gentleman was talking about, you know, I've noticed that uh, there's a lot of uh, UML modeling going on you know, for the past two to three years. And when you throw a lot of UML design out there and give your use case scenarios or sequence diagrams, everything, it doesn't work, you know, when someone is sitting in one place and sending out this diagram and ask other people to interpret it and to understand the design. That's why, I mean, I've seen people heavy on UML and how to share those designs and everything. Uh, in my experience, I noticed that, that that does not work very well. It is better to, for people to sit from a digital team and put out the ideas, you know, in design terms, um, and then finally come up with something. So yeah, I think your point on sketching is very much true to that. Like, I think the, the low fidelity thing that you can do in a room with a whiteboard, mm -hmm. <coughs> one of the techniques that we collected out of the other place was the idea of just taking photographs in the whiteboard, you know, making your photo, paper prototype by doing whiteboarding collectively. <coughs> So it's so cheap to do, and you can iterate it on, on it so quickly, and, and solve problems like in, again in like a minute instead of instead of you know it took two weeks to do the Photoshop comps and then we looked at them and they didn't really work and etc. Yeah, exactly. The live example I have, you know, I have experience at work. We sitting in Salt Lake, we were designing a screen uh, for some video solution, and we are showing the police officer car and how the video comes in. <coughs> and all kinds of stuff, and then a guy sitting in Chicago, you know, where our other branch office is, he actually sent a design laying out the GUI and sent to the people here. Developers were like, no, no, we cannot do this, you know, there is a big technical gap on what could be achieved, you know, and what someone looks at in terms of from a pure user experience perspective to what the developers look at from a technical perspective. So people 